Prescription drug abuse has become an epidemic in America. Few places have been hit harder than Kentucky, a state that's also been ravaged by addiction to crystal meth. In Whitley County, Kentucky, in the heart of Appalachia, matters were made worse when the man suspected of being at the center of the drug trade was the county's top law enforcement officer, Sheriff Lawrence Hodge. There had long been suspicions that Sheriff Hodge was dirty, but nobody, not even federal agents, could prove it. That's when two local journalists, both in their 20s, launched their own investigation. And they soon discovered poking into the affairs of a powerful county sheriff can be risky business. The story will continue in a moment. You know, you're, you're 20 years old, you're taking a shower one day and getting ready for class and you get a call from a federal agent because there's a credible threat against your life. Everything about it is just so surreal, you know, you don't, you don't think a whole lot about it. Then later that night, you know, you start thinking, you're like, geez, somebody wants to kill me. That's a little odd. Um, and, and, and it's the sheriff. The sheriff wants to kill you. This wasn't exactly how Adam Salfridge had pictured a career in journalism. Adam was born and raised in Whitley County. In 2009, he was a sophomore at the local college, needed a job. The county's daily newspaper, the Times Tribune, had an opening, and soon Adam had his first assignment and dangerous enemies. Why did you feel compelled to buy a gun? You do have a credible threat against your life, and it seemed like a pretty reasonable thing to do. Samantha also purchased a gun at the same time. Samantha Swindler, then 27, was managing editor of the Times Tribune and Adam's boss. We were reporting on people involved in the drug trade and people who are all hopped up on oxys. I don't know what they're going to do. I thought if something happened, I'd go down with a fight. Samantha was exotic by Whitley County standards, born in New Orleans, educated in Boston. She tangled with public officials as editor of a small newspaper in East Texas. She saw familiar signs in Whitley County. There are problems in this community with the good old boy system, corrupt politics, that kind of thing. It seems to me in many ways that this community's strength was also its weakness in some ways. This is a nice, polite place where people have polite conversation. People it are very proud here, and it's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing in the way that it doesn't allow you to see the things that need change. Whitley County, Kentucky, population 35,000, is tucked in the state's southeast corner on the border with Tennessee. People here take pride in the natural beauty of Cumberland Falls and in historic Sanders Cafe, birthplace of Kentucky Fried Chicken. There is also poverty. The median income is $26,000. Drug addiction is rampant. Throughout the region, red signs identify homes once used as meth labs. And then there is prescription drug abuse. Oxycodone flows in so freely they call this stretch of I-75 the pill pipeline. In 2002, Lawrence Hodge was elected sheriff of Whitley County on the promise he'd clean it up. The sheriff's raid on one meth lab was covered by the local CBS affiliate. When I knocked on the door, the smell was already knocking me down. We're glad to shut it down and put a dent in our drug problem here. But early in his tenure, there were rumors. Talk around the county, the sheriff had gone bad. From about 2004, he just went downhill and was corrupt, involved with drug dealers, uh, taking payoffs, extorting money from defendants. Todd Tremaine, a special agent with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, says the FBI and state police tried building a case against Sheriff Hodge, but couldn't penetrate his inner circle of drug dealers, crooked politicians and police officers. He was very insulated. What do you mean insulated? There was a lot of fear uh, of what Lawrence might do if they cooperated with the feder federal agents or the state police. He was untouchable? Yes. Editor Samantha Swindler had heard similar stories and suspected Sheriff Hodge might have a weakness, a paper trail. So she checked the department's evidence log. There were months where nothing was checked in. I knew that this wasn't right because we had arrest every day in this area, particularly related to drugs. And when it was related to drugs, you know there's probably a gun and it wasn't there. But to mount a serious investigation of the sheriff, Samantha needed help. Why would you hire a 20 year old? His only journalism experience was working on his high school newspaper. Well, when you say it like that. Oh, it's true. <laughs> well, he was smart and he knew about the community and he cared about um, local government. 
my aunt overdosed, and the first question I had was, I wonder if she got her drugs from somebody that the sheriff was, you know, protecting. Adam went to work, combing through years of case files. He noted a rest where drugs and weapons were seized by the sheriff's department and should have been logged. It was tedious and time consuming. At that point, I was working up to like 70 hours a week. It was, it was insane and it wasn't healthy, but I was, you know, just driven. I, I, I knew I was onto something and I couldn't stop. What he was on to was a series of felony cases involving guns and drugs in which deals were cut and sentences mysteriously reduced. What's more, the defense attorney in each case was Sheriff Hodge's close friend, Ron Reynolds. One case involved this man, Rick Benson, a retired social worker. In May 2004, Sheriff Hodge and his men raided Benson's house. In addition to drugs, they found 17 guns. Benson had a previous felony conviction on drug and weapons charges, so was forbidden to own firearms. You knew that you'd go to prison? Probably for the rest of my life. Were you scared? Were you anxious? Uh, yeah, I was terrified. Because? My world was over. During the raid on the house, Sheriff Hodge found Benson's bank statement. There was $600,000 in his checking account alone. Despite appearances, this self-described meth abuser was a millionaire heir to a publishing fortune. The night of his arrest, Benson says Sheriff Hodge offered him a deal. If he cooperated, the sheriff would see that Benson was represented by his old friend, attorney Ron Reynolds. I'd heard of Ron. And his reputation was? He could get things fixed. He said, I'll guarantee you misdemeanors, no jail time, but you're going to have to move out of Kentucky. Did you think he was on the up and up? Well, no, if he was on the up and up, he wouldn't have been able to do that. How much was his fee? $150,000. $150,000 is a lot of money. The rest of your life in prison is a lot of time. Rick Benson says he was also forced to pay the sheriff $10,000 in cash and make a donation to the sheriff's department of $25,000. That's enough to make you say, okay, what's going on here? But then whenever you see the actual cashier's check in that file where he donated $25,000 to the sheriff's department as a condition of his plea agreement, that's just, I mean, that's crazy. With information on that case and others, Samantha and Adam pressed Sheriff Hodge for an interview. He reluctantly agreed. He was just all relaxed, leaned back in his chair, um, you know, being that good old boy. So the sheriff thought it was a field trip? Yeah, you know, you got this, this little out-of-towner girl and this 20-year-old college kid. We played along, we played nice for a very long time. Let him lie. In the course of that interview, legally recorded without Sheriff Hodge's knowledge, Adam asked him about the gun seized from Rick Benson, but the sheriff's answers didn't match the facts. He claimed the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, had them. I don't even know who Rick Benson is. He was a big case. Oh, that's ATF, yeah. How many guns was it? 17. Oh, Rick Benson? Yeah. They would have just voted it. I tell you, you probably need to have an ATF right here with me if you want to talk about it. So I need to ask them if they got those guns. We well, just need to ask them about the whole case. So when the sheriff said he'd given guns to the ATF, you knew it was lying? They never took the guns. They never even opened a case in this uh, situation. And, and once we had that, I mean, he got a heck of a story. I was like, wow, I can't believe he just said that. He just kept lying, lying, lying. And I was, I was giddy. What do you make of that? The two 20-somethings right. with uh, pens and notebooks could do what seasoned law enforcement officers couldn't do. They weren't dangerous to him. I think Lawrence was thinking, hey, kids, let me show you how the sheriff's department works. You know, here's, here's the jail and here's, here's Barney and, you know, everybody from Mayberry. But they caught him off guard because they'd done their research. The reporters then filed what's called an open records request, requiring the sheriff to show where Benson's guns were stored. But six days later, Adam received a startling phone call. The sheriff's department's been bro broken into. And, you know, that, that gets you out of bed real fast. That was my we got you moment. I knew that he had staged it. I knew it. Sheriff Hodge claimed guns, drugs, and other evidence had been stolen. The office was trashed, but the door showed no sign of forced entry. It's just made to look like a burglary so they could explain for why the drugs and guns had been missing, and they'd been missing for several years. So what was Sheriff Hodge doing with these guns and drugs? Guns, gave them to political friends, sold them, trade them for uh, oxycodone. He became a drug addict. Yes, he was a very serious drug addict. He had a bad addiction with prescription pain pills. 
Adam and Samantha's interview with the sheriff and the phony burglary gave law enforcement the break they needed. The man who once thought himself untouchable was now feeling the heat. Days later, an undercover officer recorded Sheriff Hodge threatening to kill Adam. He said, I'm going to effing kill him. And the, the informant's like, no, you're, you're just mad. And he goes, no, you don't understand. I'm going to kill him. I've already been by his house. I know where he lives. Despite the threat, the Times Tribune continued to publish damaging allegations against the sheriff. And a state audit suggested he may have been stealing money from the department. He was just taking money and cashing it and during convenient times, like before a three-day weekend or right before his wife's birthday. By May 2010, the people of Whitley County had had enough. They voted Sheriff Hodge out of office. Six months later, he was indicted by a state grand jury. The most powerful lawman in Whitley County led away in handcuffs in his uniform. But Lawrence Hodge still had influence. Around the same time, two local thugs, friends of the sheriff, drove to Adams' house. The passenger in the vehicle gets out, approaches me without saying a word, puts his hand a little bit into his waistband, and I, I just quickly pulled my pistol. You had a pistol on you? At that point, I didn't go anywhere without being armed. He saw that it left the holster. I didn't point it at him or anything. And he explained that they were out looking for junk metal on my dead-end street and that they would be going now. You pulled a gun. <laughs> were you prepared to use it? Well, you never pull a gun unless you're prepared to use it. Following that encounter, federal authorities compelled Adam to leave town under their protection. Already facing state charges, Lawrence Hodge was also being pursued by federal investigators. Central to their case was attorney Ron Reynolds, the sheriff's accomplice in the shakedown of Rick Benson. Reynolds turned on his old friend, implicating the sheriff in the extortion scheme. Lawrence Hodge had no choice but to cop a plea. Prosecutor told him, we can put you in prison for a very, very, very long time. Our case is solid. You will be convicted. You can see that uh, he was defeated. Last May, two years after Samantha and Adam launched their investigation, former Sheriff Lawrence Hodge pleaded guilty to extortion, distributing drugs, and money laundering. He was sentenced to 15 years in federal prison. He declined our request for an interview. Now that's mostly from the work that the two of you did, right? Yes. Samantha and Adams' reporting also led to the conviction of 15 of Lawrence Hodge's associates. Both journalists have since left the Times Tribune. Samantha lives in Oregon, where she's editor and publisher of a small weekly. Adam, just a year out of college and unemployed, remains in Whitley County. What went through your mind when you saw Sheriff Hodge in handcuffs in his uniform? You know, a lot of people thought that I would be jumping for joy and, you know, all elated there that the sheriff got arrested. And it's really not. It's terrible that this happened. I hate to see it for my community. Mm -hmm. I hate to see that plastered all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Whitley County, synonymous now with a corrupt sheriff. I don't like that. I think, uh, I think the real story should be that a bunch of people here came together and, you know, cleaned it up. It's uh, quite a fall from grace from police chief to accused criminal, but that's what a former top cop from a tri-state community is coming to terms with tonight. Local 12's Brad Underwood broke the story when Falmouth police chief Mark Posey was suspended. He went back to Falmouth today as word of Posey's arrest spread around town. As police chief, Mark Posey was supposed to protect the public in Falmouth. But instead, the Attorney General's office says Posey was stealing public money and property from administrative funds almost the entire time he was chief. According to the indictment, Posey is to allege to have stolen more than $10,000. He's accused of forging 69 checks, some as little as $30 and others as high as $900 all coming from the county drug task force bank account. That makes me worried for our county. I mean, that's our county. I mean, that's our city county money. That's, I don't know. We definitely need to look better into who we elect and who is our next police chief. We don't want that again. Posey is also accused of buying a gun with department money and then selling it for a higher amount and keeping the profit. I think that it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy to think that someone from Pendleton County would do something like that, but I don't know. I mean, 
It's justice. I mean, I'm glad that he got caught and it didn't go on for much longer. In January, newly elected Mayor Alonda Hinson relieved Posey of duty and suspended him. In February, Posey declined his right to an administrative hearing and resigned. On the street in Falmouth, some are surprised that Posey was arrested and charged. From him being a police chief, you would think that people would try to, like, cover for him and stuff. And it's a little surprising that he actually got caught. According to the very lengthy indictment, Posey forged and cashed at least one check a month, sometimes three to four over that six-year period he was chief. Uh, he did bond out this afternoon at the moment. A court date has not been set. Rob? Brad, thanks very much. If convicted on all charges, Posey faces up to 20 years in He's prison. supposed to be fighting crime, but tonight a grand jury has indicted a Southern Kentucky police chief on four different charges. Science Hill Police Chief Robbie Gossett turned himself in this morning. He's charged with theft and abuse of public trust. Garrett Weimer has the latest on the investigation out of Pulaski County. He's the chief of this city's one-man police department. And people I spoke to say his arrest has been the talk of this small town. Some were shocked. Others say they want new police leadership. Chief Robbie Gossett was indicted Wednesday. He turned himself in Thursday morning, then posted bond. The small police department here is located inside City Hall. When I went by the police department later in the day, no one was there. I did, however, talk to Gossett's attorney. At this time, we're, we're at a loss for what these charges could possibly stem from. Gossett's accused of theft and abuse of power involving totals of at least $10,000. The indictment says it happened in 2008 and 2009. If there was this, you know, a fear of Mr. Gossett uh, being an, an embezzler, why in the world would it take seven, six or seven years, almost eight years to indict him for this crime? His attorney says Gossett is an honest man calling him a, quote, pillar of the Science Hill community. Needless to say, he's taken aback. He's shocked by this. But like everybody else in Science Hill, and I live there myself, uh, I, I don't believe a word of this. The mayor here told me he has no comment that they're going to let the situation play itself out in court. But he did say they'll have a council meeting to discuss Chief Gossett's future with the city. In Science Hill, I'm Garrett Weimer for the Fox 56 10 o'clock news. Gossett's arraignment is scheduled for December 22nd. His attorney says he will be guilty. Newly released documents divulge details in the case of a former Bardstown police officer who is being investigated for doctor shopping. We first brought you the story in March. That's when Tony Satterley was indicted on 10 counts of attaining or attempting to obtain prescription drugs by fraud, forgery, or misrepresentation. WLKY's Erica Coghill filed this report earlier. These court documents reveal just how detectives say former Bardstown police officer Tony Satterley was able to get a hold of the prescriptions. We're talking hundreds of doses of hydrocodone and oxycodone, all from several different physicians. It was at this Bardstown pharmacy where detectives say former Bardstown police officer Tony Satterley had most of his prescriptions filled. According to court documents, they were prescribed by five different doctors between January 2013 and January 2014, quote, resulting in 1,825 hydrocodone tablets and 265 tablets of oxycodone. Satterley was a patient of one of those doctors' offices. Police say Christy Morris, the girlfriend of another Bardstown police officer, was employed there. Detectives say Satterley got some of his prescriptions through Morris. According to court documents, Satterley said, quote, he honestly thought Christie was talking to the doctor about the prescriptions and that he believed the prescriptions he received from Christie were legitimate. Court records indicate Satterley began taking painkillers after a back injury. Detectives say he met Morris once outside of Flagey Memorial Hospital to get more prescriptions. Then again, at a memorial benefit for fallen officer Jason Ellis. Morris was indicted on two counts of forgery of a prescription. According to court records, she claims, quote, oftentimes the prescription pads would have the doctor's signature on them, but it was up to her and other office staff to write the prescription based off of notes that the doctor had written on the chart file. But when police interviewed that doctor, 
They say, quote, he didn't recall authorizing or approving those prescriptions. They were not valid. Satterley is expected back in court for his pretrial conference this Friday, and he has a jury trial set for September 29th. In Bardstown, I'm Erica Coghill, WLKY News. Now, Morris maintains she did not sign the prescriptions. According to court documents, she was let go from the doctor's office. She says because of attendance, she's expected back in court on Friday. Good evening, everyone. I'm Steve Bergen. A rookie Metro police officer is due in court later this week to answer to charges that include the alleged assault of one of her own. Kristen Drew is live at Metro Police Headquarters with more on what led to the officer's arrest. Stephen Ellen PD spokesman says Lauren Fanning is a patrol officer in the 8th Division that covers eastern Jefferson County. According to an arrest citation, 24-year-old Lauren Fanning, a probationary officer with LMPD, and her 23-year-old sister Catherine were kicked out of Molly Malone's Irish Pub and Restaurant early Saturday morning after Catherine poured a drink on a patron. And she had ripped the beer out of some other bystander's hand to pour on his back. This woman, who wants to remain anonymous, says Lauren then interfered. She had come up to a friend of mine and was kind of getting in her face and antagonize her, antagonizing her and trying to provoke a fight. And she whipped out her badge at the bar and was, I think, trying to use that to intimidate. The woman and her friends thought the police badge was fake, so they immediately told a security officer about the incident. The response was, oh, she is a cop. She's in here all the time. So they actually knew who she was, and I guess they instantly, once they saw that she was starting a fight, they pulled her out right away. At that point, more trouble started. The arrest citation states a detective asked the sisters numerous times to leave in a cab or get a ride home, but the sisters refused. According to the citation, Catherine told the detective, who works for Metro Police, that she, quote, knows people at Valhalla and that she is going to have the detective fired. The report stated Catherine had bloodshot eyes, slurred speech, and smelled like alcohol. As officers were arresting Catherine, records state Lauren struck the detective in the back of the neck with her fist, then punched a witness in the side of the face as he tried to help. Police said Catherine had a half bottle of vodka in her purse and Lauren a half bottle of early times whiskey in her purse. A woman who answered the phone number listed under the Fanning address would only say, referring to the arrest citation, quote, those facts are not the facts. What's being printed is not the truth. Live outside Metro Police Headquarters, I'm Kristen Drew. Two times this News. year, former Harlan County law enforcement officials have appeared in federal court. Today, it was former Sheriff Marvin Lipford. He spent two terms as sheriff there beginning in 2007 and now faces federal charges. A grand jury indicted him for misappropriating tens of thousands of dollars. WIMT's Caleb Noe was at the U.S. Courthouse in London for today's hearing and has the latest. Well, Marvin Lipford was indicted earlier this month for allegedly stealing public funds and misusing government property during his time as the sheriff of Harlan County. The allegations stem from an investigation into Lipford's actions as sheriff between November of 2011 and November of 2013. The former sheriff is accused of using money intended for controlled drug purchases and seeking reimbursement for personal expenses like food, alcohol, hotel rooms, and a subscription to a dating website. Two felony charges against Lipford each accuse him of fraudulently receiving $10,000 or more in misapplied property. Prosecutors chose not to seek jail time for Lipford prior to his trial date, but he is required to get rid of any guns he owns by this weekend. Now, Lipford's trial is set for January 17th at 10 in the morning. Prosecutors expect that trial to last around three days. Reporting in London, Caleb No, WIMT Mountain News. If convicted, Lipford faces up to 10 years in prison and a $250,000 fine. and Police fine. Chief Michael Wilhoyt and Officer Ronald Dicko are pleading not guilty in this case. I went looking for a response from the city and found only the community willing to talk. Carrollton's police chief didn't deliver the update to city council Monday night. The officer who did didn't get questioned about Chief Michael Wilhoyt's indictment, all for this. Hey, Ron. 
What's up, Adam? A grand jury indicting Chief Will Hoyt and this officer, Ronald Dicko, on multiple charges, including kidnapping. Do I get to ride up front with you? No, you don't get to ride up front. Prosecutors say Dicko drove this man, Adam Horan, to Louisville and bought him a bus ticket to Florida instead of taking him to Eastern State for a mental evaluation as ordered by this judge. His charge threatening a cab driver. You look sick to me, Adam. I mean, I am sick. Break. I'm dying. I can't even shut down. I should be in hospital. I, I have mental illness and I say stuff I shouldn't say, but I would never hurt anybody. I never have. That's going to be pretty wild going to watch that court case because, I mean, they really shouldn't have did it, but I, I guess they did. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know how the law works with that. In Carrollton Monday, the news was slow to get out about the indictment. I, it'd be, I'd, I'd really be surprised. I'd really like to see how it plays out in court and stuff. Many here are worried more about a short-staffed police department. I know a lot of them is going to be like under a lot of pressure now, yeah. trying to figure out what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. They're just going to have to keep a positive attitude about everything. Now, both Will Hoyt and Dicko are scheduled back in court December 1st. As for Horan, he's at Eastern State now, but not after an incident at a Northern Kentucky St. Elizabeth Hospital where he was accused of groping an incapacitated patient. Carol, back to you. All right, thank Tonight, you, Three Evan. Richmond police officers face charges after they're accused of misconduct. A sergeant and two patrolmen have been indicted and accused of trying to intimidate a woman who reported a sexual assault. Cheryl Glassford has details and reaction tonight to the investigation. Three Richmond police officers, Sergeant James Rogers, Patrolman Gary Murphy, and Patrolman Brian Hensley were all indicted Thursday. The indictment stems from an incident that happened last fall. They're accused of intimidating a woman who, at one point this past October, accused them of sexual assault. The woman later recanted her story during an interview with the Madison County Sheriff's Department, but now all three men are facing felony charges. Sergeant Rogers is facing charges of intimidating a participant in the legal process and tampering with a witness for allegedly using threats to influence the woman's testimony. Murphy and Hensley are faced with complicity to those same charges. They're accused of helping Rogers. Murphy has also been charged with fourth degree assault. He's accused of hitting and smacking the woman. The chief of police released this statement. It wouldn't be appropriate for us to comment on a pending criminal case. In addition, we are still bound by the police officer's Bill of Rights, which precludes us from commenting on a pending administrative matter. The officers will be summoned to court next month for their arraignment. In Richmond, Cheryl Glassford, WKYT 27 News First. The three police officers have been on... A former state trooper and a police officer are indicted after allegations that they had sexual relationships with a 15-year-old. WLKY's Mark Vanderhoff went to Brandenburg for the grand jury convened. A grand jury here at the Meade County Courthouse indicted two former law enforcement officials. Special prosecutors did not present indictments for two other officials being investigated. Former Kentucky State Trooper Stratford Young was indicted on one count of third-degree rape and two counts of third-degree sodomy. Former Brandenburg police officer Todd Matty was indicted on two counts of sodomy. It's disappointing for uh, several families, for uh, our agency, uh, for the state of Kentucky. The two men are accused of engaging in sexual acts with a 15-year-old Brandenburg girl. Two other men were also investigated. Former state trooper Jerry Clanton was fired, and former Breckenridge Sheriff's Deputy Chris Woosley resigned after being placed on administrative leave. Prosecutors would not say why they didn't present indictments to the grand jury for Clanton and Woosley. We protect and we serve to the best of our ability, and at times uh, things happen that uh, may not represent our agency uh, the way we want it represented. Young and Maddie were also arraigned, and a judge set their bonds at $10,000 each. They are due back in court on May 22nd. And in this trial, we won't get to see the evidence presented before the trial begins. A judge agreed to seal the evidence. Mark Vanderhoff, WLKY News. The next court date for both Stratford Young and Todd Matty is set for A March former Maysville police officer is now charged with stealing money from a federal drug task force. A grand jury today indicted Timothy Fagan on charges of stealing from the Buffalo Trace Gateway Narcotics Task Force. It's based in Maysville and investigates drug crimes in northern and eastern Kentucky counties. The 52-year-old Fagan served as executive director of that task force for two and a half years. According to the indictment, Fagan took money agents seized during drug raids and money task force members kept on hand for controlled drug buys.
Fagan faces up to 10 years in prison and a fine of up to $250,000. Kentucky police chief found himself on the wrong side of the law today. Thursday, a federal grand jury indicted Lynch chief Jimmy Stewart and his girlfriend, Reddy Morris. The pair faced federal drug and gun charges. Lynch's mayor told WIMT's Caleb No the arrest happened soon after they learned someone broke into City Hall. A federal indictment charges Jackie Stewart and his girlfriend, Reddy Morris, of working together to distribute meth, cocaine, and other drugs. I was disappointed to find out that there, you know, there may be charges against our chief. Mayor John Adams says he has not technically fired Stewart yet, but he is working with law enforcement agencies to figure out the future of the city police department. You just can't get out on the street and hire a qualified policeman right now. You have to take somebody, you have to hire them, you have, they have to pass a POPs test, they have to go to training for about six months. Until then, he says they will have to depend on the Benham and Cumberland Police Departments to help out. Now the mayor tells us the arrest came shortly after they discovered a break-in at City Hall, specifically at the police department. He says someone stole evidence from the evidence cabinet and the cash register from the clerk's office with about $1,500. We're running on a shoestring budget as it is. Now we, you know, we got to replace a few things in there. He says the nearby Benham Police Department is investigating that break-in. In Harlan County, Caleb No, WYMT Mountain News. For three counts listed on the indictment, Jackie Stewart and Morris face up to 60 years in prison and millions of dollars in fines. They are scheduled to be in federal court. Hold the Monday law, afternoon. but he's accused of breaking it. And tonight, Carroll County Sheriff is facing several drug related charges. Angela Ingram has that story for us. Carroll County Sheriff Jamie Kinman is known in Carrollton as a family man, someone they've known for years, a person who they trust. Jamie is one of those individuals that when uh, he walks into a room and he, he's got a grin and he lights up the room, he makes, he makes everybody feel welcome and comfortable it, and uh, no matter what the situation is. Kinman turned himself in today in Grant County. Kentucky State Police say they were tipped off about a burglary of prescription drugs last month. They accused Kinman of going into a home in Carrollton twice in February and taking hydrocodone pills. Police say Sheriff Kinman was wearing his uniform when he did it. Uh, it is it is unfortunate any time a public official, a sitting sheriff, uh, is a, uh, accused of crimes like this. I think it does undermine public trust. Kinman was attending a rehabilitation program in Grant County, but remained sheriff. People who know the sheriff say he's had a long career in law enforcement. He is well liked and people should wait for all of the facts to come out. He's got a family. Uh, he's, you know, um, and he's got, you know, he's got brothers and he's got sisters. Uh, he's got kids. He's, uh, he's got a wonderful family. So, you know, the effect that of the uh, hasten judgment of uh, some local people in our community um, needs to kind of check their mouth. Chief Deputy Rodney Hawkins is serving as interim chief. Hawkins was appointed chief deputy in 2014. In Carroll County, Angela Ingram, Local 12 News. Kinman faces two counts of burglary and two counts of theft of a controlled substance. Did you ever put handcuffs on a sheriff before? No. How no. is that for you? There's mixed feelings for me. Uh, I'm from this county. I'm proud of where I'm from. And it's very embarrassing that the chief law enforcement officer in my county is a corrupt individual. As an ATF agent, I was very proud that we were able to step in and take somebody down who thought they couldn't be caught, who thought they couldn't be stopped. What did he say to you? What did you say to him? And I told him that uh, this was just the beginning. You will be charged federally. We'll put you in prison for a long time. You need to get an attorney. You need to meet with us, and we'll see what you have to offer. Uh, and at that point, he was in denial. He said he would talk in third person. Oh, Lawrence Hodge ain't ever done that. And that's the first time he'd ever been faced with the accusation. I was like, Lawrence, I know you extorted money from defendants. I know you and Ron did it. No, Lawrence never did that. Lawrence, I know, you, I know you've dealt with drug dealers. I know you shake them down. I know you uh, get pills from them. I know you trade guns with them. No, Lawrence never did that. So he was very defiant.